Hello, and thank you for tuning in. Most of us know that we need to do more to care for the natural world around us. Forests, wetlands, the seas and coasts, and the rivers that flow into them are all utterly essential for our prosperity. They provide us with drinkable water, with the air that we breathe, with a habitable climate, with much of our food and our medicines, and as we've become acutely aware over the past year, with places to recharge ourselves and to experience wonder. And of course, as well as securing these immediate human benefits, for many people, safeguarding nature is a moral or spiritual imperative too, just as we have a responsibility to support our family and friends and neighbours, we have a duty to look after our fellow species as well. My name's Andrew Bamford and I'm here with my friend and fellow organiser of Earth Optimism, Rosie Trevelyan, to welcome you to this entire 10 day long celebration of success in conservation. And in particular to today's opening session in our Stories of Hope programme, which is all about reasons for optimism. In a moment, Rosie's going to explain why we're so excited about Earth Optimism and talk about what's coming up over the next few days. But I want to start by saying a little bit about why optimism is so important and so timely right now. Why we believe we can be positive about the future of the planet and indeed why we have to be. And for me, really, there are two different reasons. The first of these is that while we know much of the natural world is in serious trouble and that we have to act urgently if we're to avert mass extinction and prevent a climate catastrophe that will harm us all, we also know that repeated measures of gloom and doom can only go so far. They may wake us up, but we also need to be inspired. We need to know that there is an alternative, that there are ways out of these crises and that there are actions we can all take that really will make a difference. Time and again, in fields from medicine and public health through to road safety, it's been found that persistent exposure to negative messages, far from galvanising us into action, instead elicits avoidance and denial. So entirely understandable inward-looking, defensive behaviour, rather than the outward-looking behaviour change we know we need. If instead we also hear positive messages about things that are genuinely succeeding in tackling these problems and in making a difference, we can then learn what works. And so we can replicate these successes and we can all be inspired and empowered to do a great deal more and to insist that organisations and businesses and governments do the same. So I would argue that if we really want to transform things for the better, we simply have to be positive and to spread the word about what works. My second reason for being cautiously optimistic is that, contrary perhaps to what we're used to seeing online or in the papers, when we look around us, there really are very many examples from right across the world where conservation efforts are succeeding. From the Fenland landscapes a few miles from where we're recording this, to Madagascar, from the deserts of Australia, right across to the Southern Oceans, there are hundreds of cases where, despite all the problems we know about, conservation efforts mean pressures on the natural world are easing, populations are recovering, and habitat losses are slowing, and in many cases, even being reversed. The past year has taught us all, I think, about the enormous importance of the health of the natural world to human well-being. And it's also shown us something else that's fantastically important, that when we really want to, we have the capacity, both individually and politically, to act swiftly and to go to exceptional lengths to address great challenges. The job of Earth Optimism is to discover, to celebrate 
and to share what some of those actions are. During the next seven days, Earth Optimism will showcase some truly inspiring conservation success stories from around the world, and it will engage us in some practical actions we can all take in our own lives. We're going to hear from remarkable people who are saving species from extinction, restoring precious habitats, reducing plastics in the oceans, and tackling climate change, and really just making a difference to our natural world. We'll journey from the forests of India and Brazil to the wetlands of Kenya, and we'll also find out what's happening on our own doorsteps, for example, here in the Cambridgeshire countryside. The people behind these conservation successes come from all walks of life in all kinds of occupations. They are children creating nature sanctuaries for their school. They're members of fishing communities who are protecting wildlife in their seas and rivers and lakes. They're scientists who are shining the spotlight on what we need to do. And business people who have adopted sustainable practices across their supply chains. Many, many of our stories of hope will be told by people we never hear about. And that's why we're bringing them to you through this online programme. What they have in common is their care for nature has led them to take action and find real solutions to environmental problems. And the good news is you can ask many of them questions because there will be live question and answer sessions every day this week. All you have to do is go to the Earth Optimism website to register. And you can join me live tonight at 8 o'clock to ask any questions you have for Chris Packham, who's opening our Stories of Hope programme. But Earth Optimism isn't just about listening to stories or asking questions. It's about taking part. So you can explore what you can do to help the planet in our Solutions Fair, which is a huge variety of digital activities for all ages. And it covers almost all aspects of our lives, from eating more sustainably, to making gardens wildlife friendly, and how pensions can tackle the climate crisis. And to round off this inspiring and uplifting programme, we're going to hear from Sir David Attenborough about why we should have hope for our planet, as if we hadn't already been convinced. And I'm also really looking forward to hearing his answers to the questions that have been selected from the ones that you sent in. So do come back on the 4th of April for that. But as optimism is not just happening here, it's a worldwide movement. And there are similar digital events being organised from Nairobi, starting today, and Rio de Janeiro, which will kick off on the 5th of April. Looking further ahead, there's an Earth Optimism Smithsonian event, which starts on the 19th of April, and there's a live Earth Optimism event in Sydney, Australia, at around the 22nd of April. Well, don't worry, you don't need to remember all of those dates. Just check out our global Earth Optimism page on our website. None of this would have been possible without the support from our generous sponsors, and we cannot thank them enough. They are HHMI Tangled Bank Studio, the AG Leventis Foundation, RSPB, and Natural England. I'm sure but that by the end of this week, you will agree there really are reasons we can all be optimistic for the future of our planet. Conservation really can succeed, and we can be part of the solution. Join us today and every day this week to find out how. <laughs>